Dr. Beckers has a doctorate in chemical engineering from Cornell University, is a research engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and is one of the creators of GeoWires. So this is a great opportunity today to hear about this software that you can use for your GCC submission. Um, as a reminder, we do have an upcoming February 17th, 2022 sub submission deadline for your elective module progress submissions. This is a required deadline. All teams who are considering submitting a final submission must also submit this February 17th. Um, we are offering a series of webinars throughout the spring to help you with your, the various parts of your submission and project. Uh, January 6th, 2022, we will be holding a webinar about the use of leapfrog and conceptual modeling. Um, January 21st of 2022, we'll have Dr. Beckers back again to talk about direct use system design. February 1st, we'll be talking with Aaron Levine from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on, on an overview of environmental regulations and permitting for geothermal projects. And then February 10th, we will be looking at the Geo Report Seat webinar, um, also with Aaron Levine. Geo Report, the seat, the social socioeconomic tool um, has mm -hmm. been reformatted and can be used for direct use projects now. Um, so that is a great tool that is available for students. And my colleague Kelly is dropping the registration links for those webinars into the chat. So we do recommend that you go ahead and sign up for those now so that they are on your calendar. Um, as usual, all of our webinars are recorded and will be available within the week on the Hero X site. So I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Beckers. Thank you for being here today, Conrad. Yes, thank you, Katie. And um, good morning, everybody, or, or good afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. I just tested it. It should be screen number two. Um, all right. So you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, let's go to full screen. But okay. So, so yeah. So in this webinar, I will just introduce you to the GeoFires tool. Um, this is a quick outline here of my presentation. So I'll, I'll first go into the background information, a little bit of, of the history of the tool, talk a little bit more about you know, what does GeoFires do, how can you use it for your project, provide you with some references, uh, also some example files that are available online. And then I want to make it a little bit more you know, interactive and just showcase you uh, how do you you know, set it up, where do you download it, and just run a few cases um, for you. And then in the end, I'll make sure I'll leave some uh, some time for, for some questions. And I'll make sure that there's enough time in the end so that we can buy um, that in, in an hour from now that we can, we can wrap up the webinar. So this is like a, a one slide overview on what, what GeoFires is and, and where it comes from. So it, it's a tool that I originally developed in, during my graduate work. And or it, it actually is a transformed version or builds upon a tool that was in existence before that, which was called an MIT, the MIT GS tool, which was used in the future of Geothermal and Geoport. And that's, that was a tool that was written in Fortran and that was, um, so it was, it was only um, applicable for electricity production. And so I made some modifications and upgrades then in order to make it applicable to uh, direct use systems, co-generation systems. We also converted the whole code to Python. We made it open source. So right now it's, we see it more as, as, as a framework where, you can uh, set up your uh, a geothermal uh, project. It, it could be for electricity, it could be for direct use. You can modify it 
uh, you, you can add code, remove code in order to make it applicable to your very specific application. Um, and then when you, you run the tool, it will perform an analysis such as simulating the reservoir to know what are the production temperatures, production pressures, what's the drawdown. Uh, also simulating the surface application, such as how much power gets uh, generated, how much electricity gets produced, or how much heat is available uh, for your application. And then it also makes a cost assessment. It has built-in correlations for uh, how much, for example, uh, would, would the well cost or how much would a power plant cost or for direct use systems. And then it performs, um, it, it kind of combines all this information to then come up with a techno-economic metric such as a levelized cost of electricity or a levelized cost of heat um, or, or maybe even a net present value. And so at each part of this code, and I will showcase that to you, you can just use build-in correlations, you can use build-in models, or you can just use your own um, data that you have available or, ch or change the code. So that's why we kind of call it no more like a framework, it's a platform for you to perform uh, a, a, a TEA, a techno-economic assessment of the geothermal uh, plant. Um, we, there, there are several reservoir models available, ranging from, let's say, from very simple ones, such as a linear drawdown model to um, coupling with TOF2 is something we, we've made available. We have now a version also where we've coupled it with another simulator, which is Falcon. Uh, we also have the option where the user provides their own data, maybe from a simulation that they've done in, in a third party simulator, or maybe even measure data that, that um, they collected at a plant. So we, we try to make it you know, as flexible as possible to do different level of, of analysis, depending on, on what the user wants. Um, yeah, so th this is um, like a, a diagram a little bit that describes the different steps that, that it goes to. Um, um, th so the different colors here, so in, in yellow, this is something that you may not actually be using. Um, but uh, so in green, that's actually what the code does, uh, it, how, how, what, what's right now in the, in the Python code. So and I'll showcase, I'll, I'll soon go through the code and kind of highlight these different blocks that, or it shows up. But so it starts with reading in the input data that the user provides uh, in a text file. And it does some validations, make sure that the, the values are provided are within bounds and that makes sense. And, it will give you a warning if something is off, it will correct values if, if they're wrong. And if something is missing, it will also just assume a default value and give you a warning. And, so, and then it goes to these different steps that I just described. So it, it first simulates the subsurface, either using a built-in model or by using an external simulator. It simulates the well bores, and then it simulates the surface plant. This could be either a power plant or a direct use application or a combination of both. And then it goes into the, the capital and O&M cost um, assessment, and then it evaluates um, a techno-economic metric like an LCOE or an LCOA. And then in the end, it will just print everything to the screen and also will write it to um, a text file um, where you can just later open it up and look at the results. And so, and at that point, there are different things you can do. You could try to do some kind of optimization or sensitivity analysis, we um, have played around with that. We got some, you know, at NREL, we got some tools that um, perform multiple cases or simulate multiple cases with geofires to try to, for example, look at what the uncertainty is or, or to do an optimization or so. So this is something that you can either do within the Python code, or you can even have a separate tool that kind of just runs geofires sets up the input file, runs GeoFires, reads the output file, and does something uh, with that. I know that some people have done that, built their own tools, and then maybe make for plotting purposes or so. So there's different options um, that, that, that are available there. This is just an example here of some correlations that are, that are built in. Uh, so you, by default, GeoFires will use these correlations, but you don't have to do, you can, provide your own values uh, for, for these, or you can provide your own correlations. But 
These ones in particular here, this on the left, they are the correlations for power plant uh, efficiency. So if you choose electricity as your end use option, what GeoFIS will do is it will calculate based on um, your production temperature and pressure will calculate what the exergy is of the fluid. That's the max amount of power that's, that can be produced. And that multiplies that with the utilization efficiency. So this is a very um, you know, standard approach. You'll find this in, in literature. Others have done the same thing. Where, and by you, when you calculate X utilization efficiency, then you end up with what the actual net power production is of your geothermal plant. And the utilization efficiency, it depends on things like what is your type of power plant. And so there's four different types available. And also what's your ambient temperature and also what's your production temperature. You know, higher the temperature, the better your efficiency will be. Um, also, I don't show it here, but they all, um, GeoFIs will also calculate what your return temperature is for your geothermal power plant, which you could use for, for example, a direct use application and a cogeneration uh, setup. On the right here, these are drilling cost correlations that are built in. These are from the GeoVision study from a, a report from Sandia National Laboratory that was published uh, a few years ago. Um, so these are, um, so your, your geothermal power plant typically, you know, the, the capital costs are always are very significant and the drilling is, is a big part of it. If you have to drill a few wells, you'll see that if you have to go a few kilometers deep, we're quickly talking about tens of, of millions of, um, of dollars. And so this is a very important um, uh, cost factor of, of your project. And so it's probably recommended to, if you have data for your very specific site, to just use the drilling cost, maybe from a quote from a uh, drilling company or so, or from wells that have been drilled in the area, if you have drilling costs available, I, I recommend using those numbers because it's very uh, location specific. And you know, in some places like for example, Texas or Pennsylvania, where there's a lot of drilling activity and where um, there's a lot of knowledge, you probably will be a little bit lower than these geovision baseline drilling cost correlations, which are more, let's say, representative for, for EGS for a country, for nationwide. And so that is one, one comment that I do want to make here. Um, but if you do want to use the correlations, but for example, want to um, lower them by a certain per percentage, that's also possible. You can, uh, for example, say, well, I want to have, I assume, you know, a 20% reduction in drilling costs, for example. So it has that. Uh, the tool has that flexibility um, to, to play around uh, with it like that. So the, here are a few references that um, I think would be useful to look at if you decide to, to use the tool. Uh, so in, in a sense, it, it's ranked here from uh, chronologically. So this is the most recent uh, publication specifically on the tool. This was published, I think it was in early 2019, where um, this was the this documents the, the major upgrades in a sense that we did uh, at NREL. Uh, a colleague Kevin of mine and myself, we uh, as I mentioned, we converted the code to Python, and we made it open source, we updated cost correlations and such. So that's all documented in, in this paper, and it also links to um, a GitHub folder where we, um, the information is available. And so this is a link here if you're interested in looking at that paper. If you download the tool from GitHub, then it comes with a manual which has some useful information. Specifically, it explains the different example problems that are provided, but also it lists all the different input parameters that you can use, what are their units, and also what are the, the, the minimum and maximum that you have to stay in. So uh, I'll, I'll open that file later uh, just to show you um, how it looks like and what's in there. Then there's uh, also my thesis that has some interesting information because it provides some correlations that are not published in some of these other documents. Uh, thus, uh, this was still before we converted to Python, but some of the correlations, you know, they were still the same. So it is worthwhile. That's also just available on the web. We'll have to look at it if you want to dig more into uh, the code. And finally, the original GeoVirus version may be worthwhile looking at it because we did run a lot of cases with it, more cases than we did in, in, in this last paper. So it's another, I think, useful reference that's available online. Uh, then more recently, we, and this may be very applicable to 
uh, the competition here because I think focus will be on uh, is on direct use. And so this is a project here that where we use geofires for uh, six deep direct use projects uh, in, in the US. And this, this was just done uh, last year and this year, this paper that I show you on the right was just published in the spring of this year. There's a link here. And so what, what we did in this paper, we looked at these six different projects. These are, uh, these were DOE funded projects uh, doing a, an assessment of, the, of deep direct use at their site. But each project kind of did a different approach and, and used different parameters. What we did in this project was in a sense, summarizing all the findings and rerunning some, some of those simulations with GeoFires to try to make it a little more uniform and to make to, to come up with some, some takeaway messages, if you will. Uh, and so you see some are on the Western United States here with high gradients. There's some on the Eastern US here with lower gradients. Different applications were also considered um, where actually four of them just use district heating, but then one use thermal storage and then also one uses um, cooling. So using an absorption chiller for cooling. And so what we did is with this, um, for in this project, we modified the GeoFires code for these six different applications. And so the costs, for example, were very specific, but also given that the applications were, were very different, we had to, for each project, modify the code and, for example, incorporate a district heating network or incorporate the performance of a heat pump system. And, and in a sense, this is where I think the strength is of GeoFires, where you can just, just tailor, the, modify the code, add lines of code, remove lines of code in order to apply to your uh, very specific uh, application. And if, if this uh, is something that you think may be useful for your project, it is worthwhile to, to take a look on GDR because all the GeoFires files and all the, the input and output files, they were um, uploaded. Uh, online to GDR. So you just go to, and I think we probably can share this, this presentation also with you so you can have the link um, right there and then you can just see uh, all the files you just click download <laughs> and then you just, that may be a, an interesting starting point for your project. So now I just want to um, show to you or demonstrate to you how do you uh, download it, where do you find the code, and also what do you need for software requirements for, for running the code, and then in the end, how do you like run it and get results? So the, the first step would be is just finding uh, the code um, on, on GitHub, and so of course, there's, I guess depending on, on the platform you use and um, depending on, on what kind of you know, setup you have uh, with, with Git, you, there's different ways of getting access to the code, but this, this just shows maybe the easiest way uh, for new users. You can just go to the website and you just click on download the zip file and then you just have uh, all the code. It, this this GeoFires, it, it's not the tool, it's not, um, we don't really make updates very frequent. It, it's a very, let's say, a small project <laughs> at NREL. It's not that there's multiple people working on it uploading or pushing updates every week or so. So I think you're fine with just downloading the code. And then, you know, once in a while you can take a look if there is some new, um, some new code available. And we have some updates in the works. So at some point that probably will be a new version uh, uploaded. But so yeah, when you download the zip file, it will just uh, download all these files in a zip file. And that's in a sense, if you extract it on your computer, uh, extract the zip file on your computer, this is in a sense how it looks like. And, the GeoFires code, it's actually just one file the way it's set up right now. It's this here, this, this Python file that I highlighted in blue here. There is another one here that's not available online yet where it's, a, it's one that probably will eventually be uploaded. Uh, that's one where we did a coupling with Falcon, which is another uh, reservoir simulator. But then these other files, um, just want to quickly say there are some example files there and I'll, I'll run a few uh, in just a minute, uh, but there's also, some of these references that I just showed, there you can just download them uh, directly from the journal website, but they're also included in the references folder here. There's some additional conference presentations in there as well. Then there is a manual that I, I'll, I'll show you as well in just a minute. And then there's um, some, this actually is HDR out, that's an output file that just gets re rewritten when you run the simulation. And there's also some 
no additional information that's on GitHub, like the readme file and then the license file. And so once you have the, the, the GeoFire's code, the other information um, or the other tool that you need is actually you need something to run <laughs> Python to, to um, modify the code. Uh, you could do it in just a text editor, but that's probably not really a recommended. The one that I recommend that I've been using is just Spider, which comes with with Anaconda, and it's also um, just just free uh, for anyone to download for different platforms. So this is the web link here. You may already have it, or you may have a different one. Uh, but if you download Anaconda, and you see right now we're already at Python 3.9. I still have 3.8. You want to say you don't want to go to uh, to 2.7. I don't think it will run with that. It was really set up for for three. Um, and higher, like I think 3.7 and 3.8 is, is when we um, when we converted it. But I've been running it on 3.8 to run fine on, uh, on 3.9. Um, and so, uh, so once you download that, install it, you'll have a spider available. And when you open that, that's how it looks like on my computer. Uh, you can, you know, it may look different on your computer. You may not have the dark background or so. This is all just settings that you can change. Uh, but if you open uh, Spider, all you need to do, and I'll just show that in just a minute, you just need to open the GeoFars code and that's it. Then you're ready to, to run cases, um, to modify the code and look at results and such. So uh, what you'll see here is you see the code here on the left. And, Maybe in particular, I want to highlight this is maybe a one line. You probably want to change once in a while. This is the file that you will be running, the text file with all the input files. In this case, it's set up to run example two. And then when you click run, it will run the code and then show all the results uh, on the right side here, uh, such as things like LCOE are here and, and production temperatures, uh, etc. So I think this is a good moment to kind of just showcase that. Um, before we go into Q and A, I just want to make this now a little bit uh, interactive, or or just just run on my computer. Let's see if okay. So I have it open here. Um, so before I go into this, just want to show you uh, go back to this folder because I think there are some important things here. I want to show you first. So maybe first of all is the user manual. If you open that one, this is how it looks like, and. Um, there's some information here that's also included in the publications and the references that I showed, but provide some background information to what it does or what, how you could use it for your project. It also goes through the different steps that I, um, that I uh, just highlighted and you can like review them here um, to in different installation steps. But this is in a sense here, what it's not listed in these other references that I wanna show you here. So there are different examples included, and this shows what each example tests or what each example uh, runs in the code. So you'll see some focus on EGS, some focus on hydrothermal. Uh, we use different uh, reservoir models. So in a sense, we picked six examples because there are six reservoir models that are uh, included. And um, so each example just tests a different one. So I'll, I'll did mention some are very simple, like the percentage drawdown one, um, the single fracture is also very simple. This example one and two, these two, these first two models, they do use an inverse Laplace transform. That's what you need to simulate those two. So they're a little bit more uh, advanced, but it still runs very quickly. So there's no problem there. And then example five, it does go into, it provides an example um, where the user has a text file with the, this, the production temperature, for example, that is measured, that is an output from a simulator. So this is, I think, worthwhile to look at too, if you have data available, just to kind of show you, the, shows the, the format that you need to use to, to import it. And then finally, this example six, it shows an exam, uh, a case with TOF2, a very simple one, but it just runs, uh, it sets up the input file for TOF2, runs the TOF2 simulator, and then also, um, reads the, the output from TOF2 and then kind of continues the simulation in GeoFires from, from that point onwards. So the, the TOF2 executable, it is not provided with GeoFires. This is due to 
licensing issues. But if you are, um, and I'm sure this project falls under there, if it's for academic purposes, you can obtain free of charge a license from uh, LBNL, um, from, from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And so they can actually provide you the, the executable and then uh, it should run fine. So it is set up now with TOF2. We have not tested it yet with TOF3, which I know that is available uh, at this point. Um, but it should, I think, from what I told, it should work with TOF2 input file as well. And then finally, um, you see these different example files also touch on different applications that I talked about a little bit. Some just look at the electricity. Um, some different type of plan, like this is a subcritical ORC, this is uh, an ORC a subcritical, and this is, has a flash plan in it. But then also these examples are direct use heat, two, five, and six, and this is actually a cogeneration example. And then finally, I didn't talk about it yet um, in detail, but there are different economic models that are built in there from, let's say, a very simple fixed charge rate model uh, to, I guess, the standard, this is standard levelized cost that just standard discounting model, also very straightforward. Then uh, the bicycle model um, you know, from binary cycle. This actually uh, is a little more detailed. You can provide some more information with that one, uh, such as our tax rates and investment tax credit, etc. So in a sense, depending on, on the type of analysis that you want to do, the type of application, you can select these different uh, models. And these examples kind of showcase how to do that. And finally, I, uh, that's uh, also important here, I think in this manual is number six. This, this shows the different parameters that you can use uh, in, your, in your simulation. So when you run, an, um, when you run a GeoFIS file, what it does is it will look for an input file. And this is a text file which, which lists the, uh, or which set up the case study that you try to do. And so in the GeoFIS, folder when you download it, there are different example files uh, included. I, I think on GitHub right now, it's only one through six. Seven is actually one with, with, with Falcon. That's not uploaded yet. Um, but these, these different examples, so the information of each case study is just included in an example file. And this is when you open it, this is how it looks like. What it, when you run the code, what it looks for are these keywords such as the reservoir model, and then there's a comma, and then there is a number, like two in this case. All this information above and everything behind here, that's just additional information. It doesn't really matter what you put there. These, in a sense, are just comments. But these keywords, those are important, and, and this number, which, and so it's important that it starts with the keyword, and then there's a comma, and then there's a, a value. And that, so that's, in a sense, what, what it looks for. And um, these different keywords that are available, they are listed in section six of the manual. And so they're, they're grouped here into you know, the subsurface ones, the surface ones, and the financial parameters, and then you have the, these cost ones, and then some additional ones specifically related to the, the simulation. And so the ones I just showed you, you know, the first one here, the, the order doesn't really matter, but I tried to group them here so they kind of follow this the manual and they um they're still they're like grouped together. Like these are all the subsurface ones, for example. So the first one here says reservoir model comma two. So you kind of can see here some additional information. So two means that's the, the 1D linear heat sweep model. So I didn't really you know, provide more information here on what each model it is, but that's kind of covered in you know, my thesis. And that was also in the, the GeoFires publication and that we've references to the original publications for these models were introduced and developed. But so here you can see then what this value, uh, what they refer to, and it also tells you if it's a required parameter or if it's an optional one, what is the default one, uh, what are the units? Like in this case, it doesn't, it has no units, but in other cases, um, it does have units. For example, when you specify a geothermal gradient, you'll see you know, this is in degrees C per kilometers. Uh, so that's, it, you know, it's kind of important. We try to stick to mostly to you know, SI units um, as much as possible uh, or, or as close as possible. Um, and then the, the, the range that you see, this is um, a range that's built into GeoFires. It makes sure that each, when you provide this value, that they are within this range, because if they're not, it will provide you a warning and actually correct the value to a, 
um, default to the default value um, that is shown there. And so you kind of, there's about 90 or so parameters, but many of them are optional. So you don't need to use all of them. So in a sense, if you start with one of the examples files, you, you could very quickly just set up a case uh, and, and, and start running. Um, so yeah, so, so that's the manual. Now I just want to show you uh, how that looks like. So when you open the, the GeoFires code, it's just all in one file and it's kind of shown here uh, on the left here. So this is how it looks like. Um, you can see, you know, it, it are about, I'd say two to 3000 lines of code, but you know, a lot of it, several hundreds of lines of code are related to just reading in the input. And that is actually shown here, um, all these first different, uh, when you try something, the code will try to read in um, the value for, for example, the utilization factor gives you warning if it's not provided. It also, if it's outside the range, it will give you warning and it will, it will just pick a default value. So if you need to modify the code for your application and you have, let's say, a very specific surface application with additional information, you may need to include additional input parameters. And the way to do that is, you probably just want to want to copy um, code like this, and, and then um, just modify it, you know, for your purposes. Just change the, you know, don't use the same keyword. Use a different keyword. Pick some bounds for it. Provide also warning message to the user if you want. And that's a way I think to easily you know, modify the code already and, and start, uh, you know, with with different input parameters that you may need for your application. So in a sense, you can just start what's there and just kind of copy paste <laughs> um, for, for your application as needed. So in a sense that the first, you know, several hundred lines, so that's in a sense, just going through all the different input ones. Um, and so let's, let's keep going. So it's still, okay, we're at the OLM cost now. Okay, so here it goes to different reservoir simulations. You kind of see that here. Uh, depending on your reservoir model right here, it will start, it runs this, 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 this um, the subsurface simulations. I did mention some models are more advanced than other ones. This is the first, the, the multiple parallel fraction one, and this does do the, um, the inverse Laplace transform. Um, then the good thing is with Python, unlike with Fortran, with Python, we're able to use these built-in uh, libraries that are available, like mathematical libraries, to actually uh, do very easily an inverse Laplace transform. Uh, so that was actually another reason why we converted it from uh, Fortran to um, to Python. Then, if you run TOF2, if you have the TOF2 executable in your computer and you want to use it for running TOF2, then you it, you would need model six. What it does here in this line is it, it prints an input file. And for those of you who use TOF2, this probably looks very familiar. This is a, a TOF2 input deck. And this is set up now for a, a doublet with one injection, one production well. It does use all the parameters that you specify, such as the material properties. These are dimensions of your reservoir, you know, things like lifetime, injection temperature, and flow rate. If you have a, a different setup, you'll have to do a some modifications to the TOF2 input file, uh, but I think this should be a nice you know, starting point uh, to do that. And so once the subsurface is done, it will go into the, the pressure drop calculations, pumping power calculations. It needs to know how much, what's the size of the pump, how much electricity uh, will, will the pump consume to circulate the fluid. Uh, so that's in a sense what's done in the next lines of code. We try to put to provide as much comment as possible. Uh, where, for example, here you see now we go into the surface section where we calculate electricity or direct use heat. If you pick electricity, it will you know, calculate the uh, availability or exergy, and then it will calculate the utilization efficiency of your power plant. And what you see here, all these different lines of code, this is just a representation um, of the correlations that are just plotted here. So if you have your own power plant model, you probably don't want to use the building ones. You could just you know, delete these or bypass these. All you have to do is you have to make sure at the end 
your anti-U, which is your utilization efficiency as the value that is applicable for your uh, power plant. In setting up the geofires correlations, we looked at different refrigerants, for example, uh, but there are other ones out there that we didn't look at that maybe you know, may find a different utilization efficiency. We also kind of limited ourselves to from 100 to 200 degrees C, but there are definitely cases where you, you still want to use an ORC plant over 200 degrees Celsius. So also there you either are extrapolating or you probably want to provide your own number. But with flash, we just looked at single and double flash. You know, there's triple flash, for example. There are power plants where you have a combination of a flash and an ORC plant. So there are definitely cases where you may have to rely on, on different values for utilization efficiency that you could just you know, provide yourself or um, that from a manufacturer or maybe from a simulation that you did yourself like in Aspen Plus or XC Pro or so. And finally, uh, it goes into all the costs. These are you know, well costs that I also showed you. Uh, these are geovision well cost correlations that are shown there. And then it also goes into different components of a capital cost like exploration. Um, so you have power plant, the well field, and it estimates also the o and cost. So this all happens in, in, on these lines of code. Um, okay, here starts the o and cost. And then finally, it just calculates you know, on an annual basis how much electricity or heat gets calculated because that's what you need in order to run or to estimate your levelized cost of electricity or heat. And then depending on the model that you pick, it will use a different model for coming up with that number. And then finally, everything from here down below, this is just printing of results. Uh, so you probably you know, don't need to change that. You may have to add, if you have some additional for a very specific application, you may have to add an extra parameter so that you want to print to the output file. But again, you can just do that very easily by just copy paste the code. Uh, in a sense, you just use the same command. You now, first it actually prints to this, this file HDR out. Uh, which is what we've shown um, on here. So the, the results are printed here, uh, but in addition, they are also printed to the screen on the right, which is actually the last section of the code, which is here. This just gets printed uh, to the screen over here. And you see this is just a summary of results um, where I'll just, I'll just start from the top here. If you just, this is for example two, what you do, you just click run, um, and then you can go from the top. It does provide, so it starts actually right here. Uh, you see it provides some warnings first on the top. So you definitely want to take a look at that. If you didn't forget to provide a certain parameter, um, it will use a default there. It, it also is possible that it provides errors. In, then in that case, it will just stop the simulation or throw an error at you. That for example, if you select you want to run TOF2, but it doesn't find TOF2 executable, it will just stop the simulation. It cannot continue at that point. Um, but in this case, it's, these were not very important, these parameters. Uh, so it just used a default value for those. And then it, you kind of see this example too, it does a direct use application. In this case, it's about a 21 megawatt plant, and this is a levelized cost of heat. So this is in dollar you know, per million BTU. We did go there for, for English <laughs> metric because, or English units, because it is a very popular uh, metric, you know, for example, compared with natural gas prices. Uh, so that one we did stick with, we did stay there for dollar per million BTU. But if you run electricity, it will calculate a cents per kilowatt hour. And then you just go into some results for the subsurface and the, and the surface, so you see results related to you know, the, the reservoir production temperature. Uh, for example, you know, what's the maximum, what's the average, et cetera. These are uh, pressure drops that are being calculated in the wells and overall pressure drops that's required for the, the pumping sizing and power. And then finally, it goes into you know, megawatts and costs. So you can see the breakdown here of the capital costs. It does go to you know, the well field surface plant, exploration, field gathering, stimulation costs, that's for an EGS. If you don't need some of those, it's very easy to deactivate some of these components. You can just set them to zero and it, will, it won't um, use the correlation. Or if you know your own numbers, you can just overwrite the correlation and provide your numbers directly. For example, for an exploration cost, if you know well drilling costs, you can pro directly provide costs for the well field. 
And then finally, you see here uh, a decline curve, if you will, um, well, or, or the data points like over time that you could make a plot with. For example, what is the, the heat production over time? You see there is some drawdown in this case. Maybe we, we picked a rather small reservoir where the temperature kind of peaks initially, but then it goes down while it's 170 plus here. In the end, it's only 153 degrees Celsius. You kind of see the megawatt also dropping slightly. Um, so this is in a sense, uh, you know, how to run it, what it does. If you want to run a different example, um, all you have to do is just, you know, you change, change the number there. For example, change that to one, then it will just run example one. And this one is the multiple parallel fractures that may take a, an extra second to run. There are a few additional warnings here. Maybe we didn't provide all the information in the example file related to, looks like for the pressure, it has to use all the default ones that are built in. Uh, but this one is an electricity scenario. You can see electricity. That was a five megawatt plant, so rather small plant. You know, maybe relatively expensive, almost 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, you can see, you see we actually, um, uh, was an ORC plant. We only were producing power. We only had 167 degrees C uh, over time, so maybe not that high. Uh, but you can again see for those what are the costs, and then what are you know the, the capital, what are O and M costs. See this time it calculates an LCE in cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so let's see. I believe I have top two on here. So that is example six. Let's see if it if it. I oh, know I don't think it does not. You see, it does throw an error. I don't have the top two in there. I think I just downloaded directly this file from um, from the GitHub, and it does, doesn't commit it. So that's the error. What will happen when you try to run uh, K6? So it does need the top two executable for that one. Um, so example five. That's one where just want to showcase that um, it, this one. Uh, it, it uses the user provided, so it uses reservoir model number five. What it does is it looks then for an, an additional file, and this is the kind of format that we use where this is uh, the production temperature um, that is being actually used a different simulator to calculate this production temperature per, per file, and this is the time in year. This was a 30 year simulation, and we'll just um, it provides the profile, so it kind of goes from 150 to 120 degrees Celsius. So that data is then being used. We do also use, I believe, a Welber model on top of that. So the numbers, you know, the, in the sense that's the, the reservoir output, which then goes to the Welber. So the temperature is a, a, a little bit more um, temperature drawdown happening in the Welber. So even lower temperatures, you know, at the surface. So that's in a sense, you know, case number five. And so uh, maybe the last thing, you know, before we go into Q&A, I want to make sure there's enough time. Uh, what I want to show you is if you, so this is example two again. This is a very simple direct use one. Let's say you want to do some changes. So what you have to do then is um, you just kind of have to go into the text file. You see this case, I just opened with a text editor. Um, that's kind of, you know, a simple way of doing it. If you uh, want to do batches of simulations, you may want to go away from this format using a text file. There are ways where you can just use the parameters directly inside um, the, the, the Python code. Let's say you assume a range of values for certain parameters so that you can modify it in a sense uh, as, as needed for your application. Uh, but if you want to just use the very like case by case study, you, can, you just have to go into the input file and then you have to do you no know, changes in there. Let's say the geothermal gradient is not 55, but for example, 65. You all have to do is just change this right there, and then you you save it, and then you just have to to rerun it. And so it, it just reruns then the latest file. And then um, this case, uh, you know, we kind of went from I think 22 to about 28 megawatts because you know we have our geothermal gradient was significantly higher. And that translated into you know, higher power output, also lower, that translates that into lower levelized costs, et cetera. So that's in a sense how you would, um, how you would you know, modify the example, examples files for you know, maybe tailored for your specific application. You have to go into a text editor you know, and chart, start changing these uh, different um, values. 
you may want to uh, make an, a file or have, maybe have a case study that is more of a combination of different examples. You may have to copy paste from a few different example files to kind of set up your very specific uh, application. And given that I think um, focuses here on, on the right use, it, I think it is worthwhile to take a look at those GeoFires examples files that are uploaded on the GDR because there are some examples there where we imported a heat pump, for example, or a district heating system, et cetera. So I think that would be all um, useful uh, to take a look at. Yeah, and, and with this, I, I think we have you know enough time, more than 10 minutes still. I uh, want to make sure there's some time here for, for Q&A, for some questions related to GeoFires, uh, related to installing it. Um, here, I do want to here provide my email address in case you have uh, some questions that maybe that, that show up later. So just shoot me an email. I'm happy to to answer your questions. You know, if if you run into some trouble uh, with, with geofires, and so I want to just um, open the chat box here because I see there are some presentations uh, already in there. Uh, some questions in there. So. Maybe let's start with the last one here. The, so the closed loop cases, it is something that we have done. We have used GeoFires for closed loop, but we used our own reservoir simulator for doing that. So the, the built-in reservoir models are very much for hydrothermal and EGS. But once you have, that you have a certain production temperature at the surface, you can just use existing power plant correlations or direct use correlations that are built in or also the whole uh, economic assessment of LCUH or LCUE calculation, uh, that's still relevant, whether it's closed loop or hydrothermal or EGS. So in a sense, you can use it, but you have to do some, some modifications. In our case, we had some reservoir output. We used model five for um, using um, input or using the output from the simulator as input into GeoFires. We used COMSOL and, and the standard body theory model for, for running uh, the closed loop cases. So um, I suggest that could be an approach you, you take a look at if that's what, what, what you want to do. Then I see there's another uh, question. Um, that's 2 million barrels of water per day. Um, okay. <laughs> so. The input though, um, right now the, it requires a kilogram per second for flow rate. And so you'll have to convert, you know, the two millions of barrels of water per day to a certain flow rate. I, I assume this may be, you maybe have one production well, one injection well or so. So you'll have to, you know, set the number of, of wells to just, just one. Um, so that's, that's there. If you just want to look at, you know, just, take one well, and then you'll need to set the flow rate. It is right now in SI units, um, so for, for flow rates. And so um, you see this is this one here, it has 30 kilogram per second. So you'll have to just convert the 2 million barrels to, to 30 kilogram per second. And then if you know you, you have exactly 90 degrees C, what you would need to do is, it, GFIs does need to know adapt because it goes into the drilling cost correlations, it goes into the well bore model. So you would have to then assume a certain depth of your well, um, and then a certain gradient that corresponds to 90 degrees C as your production temperature. So that's kind of like how you have to address that. If you have, let's say, um, existing well where your water just comes to the surface already, you can just put your drilling cost to zero, so you don't need to account for well cost anymore. You may also have, um, let's say, hot springs or so, something like that, an application where you don't really care too much about wells. That's what you can also do. If best is there, just put the, uh, the just turn off the well bore model and just turn off um, the, dr the drilling cost and turn off the stimulation cost. So all those just can be deactivated in a sense that will also get you you know, the same thing as just bringing 90 degrees Celsius to the surface to be used for an application. Um, so I see there is some other question here. Um, yeah, so about inflation. So true, what, what we do every time when we upgrade geofires, we always try to 
you know, account for, you know, br bring the drilling costs, bring the surface plan costs, bring all the cost relations back up to date to the latest uh, current dollars, if you will. And so what we've, do what we've done in the past, we just looked up these uh, producer price in indices um, that are available online. I'm not sure from the Bureau of Labor or Bureau of Statistics that they're published, I think, on an annual basis or so, or, or maybe even more frequent. Uh, but that's kind of like the, the, the inflation values that we use. And so we kind of multiply the existing correlations then um, up to latest information. And that may, of course, be very important right now with the high inflation that we're seeing this year. So you may indeed have to account for that. So what we have built in is like each cost correlation, you can multiply with a certain uh, factor. Like let's say you multiply it with 1.05, that means it's a 5% increase. And those are shown, those are listed in the manual. When you go to the cost correlations, um, there are, um, you'll see parameters showing up related to, I'm just trying to show some like here an adjustment factor. So those are listed as adjustment factors. So they, then you use the building correlation, but you multiply it with a, a factor. For example, this is useful to account for inflation, like, like you asked for, but also let's say a sensitivity analysis, let's say drilling costs could be plus or minus 25%, then you can adjust, you can use this adjustment factor and multiply it first with 0.75, that would be a 25% reduction or 1.25, that would be 25% increase, if you will. So I think that's the way to account for the in inflation. Um, so let's see, there is some other questions here. There is a question about the production temperature. Um, so, to, so they are used as a numpy array, that's right. Um, and the production temperature is indeed, is, is calculated before we go into the power plant model. So it uses that to calculate, you know, your utilization efficiency and your exergy. Um, so the question is if we need to rewrite the code to run. Okay, so yes. Um, so indeed right now the code is set up. It is set up to do some kind of transient analysis, some kind of dynamic analysis where kind of the reservoir gets calculated first. And then you calculate with that how much production temperature you get. And then we calculate with, with that, you could then calculate, okay, what's now my, my reinjection temperature? Because in most cases, most reservoirs, we find that, you know, your reinjection temperature in some reservoir, it won't have much impact anymore on what your production temperature is, especially in these, let's say, large hydrothermal systems or so. But that may no longer true, for example, for closed loop geothermal systems and or e smaller EGS type reservoirs where there's definitely could be some breakthrough and then you kind of have a feedback loop. I do think you'll have to do some um, change of the code um, where you kind of have to uh, recouple uh, couple it where, you in where the, the, the temperature leaving the power plant becomes back to reinjection temperature and goes back to the reservoir. So yeah, you'll have to do some changes in the code. The building reservoir models though, they are you know, rather, I guess, simple that they require a constant injection temperature. Um, so you would have to use you know, a more advanced simulator to account for a varying injection temperature as a function of your power plant output. You know, I know probably TOF2 can be set up like that where you change it over time, um, but you definitely have to do some changes in the code for that. Um, yeah, so, so let's see, there's one final question here related to the data hole. So, so if you want to do a full THMC simulation, <laughs> Um, yes, um, yeah, we, with TOF2 right now, we only are doing a TH simulation. We don't account there for, for geomechanics and chemistry. Um, so yes, if you want to use geofars, so I guess you can't even use TOF2 at that point anymore. You have to use a different simulator to do a THMC simulation. That's actually one of the reasons why we went to Falcon because that allows doing that. That will be eventually uploaded. 
uh, but we kind of still focus there for now more on the TH simulations. We haven't really looked more on, on geomechanics and chemistry. If you want to indeed use geofires kind of like as a, as a wrapper for a reservoir simulation like that, I think indeed you'll have to use, you know, have to do some, quite some changes. You'll need a lot more input in order to simulate your, your geochemistry, um, your geomechanics, so that your input file will become very different. Um, I, I think what, what I recommend then, if you, um, you probably want to use an existing input file you have for your THM simulator. That's kind of like what I did, um, you know, for, for geofires. You know, this is a rather short one. It's kind of just copy paste from an existing input tag that I had for, uh, for tough two, and so you probably want to just copy paste, and then just extend your input deck here that's being generated for your simulator. Um, but you probably can just use the same command. It's just f dot write, and then it just prints a line. And so it's not that difficult to just you know copy paste and make an input file. You probably, if you want to read in additional information, that's right now we're just reading in the production temperature. Uh, that's um, What's actually done here? So the TOF2 produces a, an F FOF file, FOFT as it's called. So that it comes, uh, there has the, the production temperature shown there um, for a certain grid point that we selected as our producing element. And we just read in, you know, from there, like it's the simulation time, production pressure, production temperature. Uh, we have to do some interpolation and such, but that's in a sense what, what we're doing there. And you may have to modify this segment as well, um, because your simulator may export it a little differently. Um, so I think, I hope that addresses your question. If not, please just send me an email. We may we can just have a conversation offline. This may require a little bit more in-depth discussion here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we only have one minute left. I don't, <laughs> we're right on time. Um, if there are, other questions, just send me an email. Um, I, I think Katie said that this will be available on, online, this presentation, or uh, definitely the recording will be available. Um, oh, I see that. Yeah. First, Katie. That's right. I think that yeah. must be where you can share the slide deck. Uh, I can send you the, the presentation, then people can take a look at this. <laughs> I'll just stop sharing here. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckers. Um, and thank you everyone for attending today and for all of the great questions. Um, as we did say earlier, we will be posting a recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF of the slides that Dr. Beckers used during the presentation on the HeroX site next week. Um, so please make sure that you are following the HeroX site so that you get an email notifying you that those have been posted. Um, we do also recommend that you or encourage you to sign up for the other webinars that we'll be having this fall. And please don't forget about the February 17th um, progress submission deadline. So thanks everyone for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Beckers for this very informative webinar. We appreciate your time um, and have a great day everyone and um, enjoy your winter breaks for everyone who is um, at university. Yes, thank you all. Have a, have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.